with your kids. Hola, ni hao, konnichiwa, assalamu alaikum, shalom, mahaba, morning, muliwanji, namaste, jambo, bienvenidos. Hi, my name is Jed Lee, and this is a special Protecting the Planet with Your Kids episode of the Reading with Your Kids podcast. We are coming to you from the beautiful neighborhood of Reedville in the southwest corner of Boston, Massachusetts. We are so delighted that you are joining us. Please be sure to subscribe to the show on the iHeartRadio app, on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Spotify, wherever you find your podcasts. Our guest today is Rachel Sarah. She is here to celebrate her beautiful book, Girl Warriors, How 25 Young Activists Are Saving the Earth. Hey, Rachel, how are you? Thank you so much for having me, Jed. I'm so excited to be here. I'm really excited to have you here as part of our Protecting the Planet with Your Kids series. Um, I, you know, I guess the first question I have to ask you is, uh, what inspired you to write Girl Warriors? Great question. So I grew up in the 90s really thinking that... Uh, if you just do simple things like turn out your lights, you can make a big difference in the world. And while individual actions are really big, um, I had no words for the climate crisis growing up, even though I grew up in the drought of California. It was just like, oh, be sure to just take a short shower. Well, then jump ahead. I'm a mom. Um, I had my first daughter in the year 2000 as a single mom. Then had um, another daughter 12 years later (laughs) and living back in California, um, the wildfire started to rage here. And this was 2018, Greta Thunberg started speaking up and telling the UN and telling the world that there's a crisis going on and we should treat it like a crisis. And she also said, you know, you love your children above all else, and yet you're stealing their futures in front of their very eyes. And that's how I felt as a mother. I was terrified. I wanted to tell my children that we're safe, everything's going to be okay, but the smoke was so bad. Schools closed. Um, We knew so many people who had to evacuate. And I just had to do something. So I have a journalism degree. I had pivoted for years um, and gone into marketing communications. And I decided I need to return to journalism and I need to do something and need to use my skills and, um, and interview all of these young climate activists all over the world who are rising up for my future, your future, for the future of children everywhere. So I definitely want to find out some of these great activists that are around the world that are role models, not only for kids, but for old people like me. Uh, But first, your mom, and and one of the things that we want to do here with this series is to give parents the information they need so that they can inspire their kids and, and actually be active with their kids to save the world and protect our planet. But we don't want to frighten them. So how did you approach that with your kids? How did you start talking to your kids about climate change without scaring the life out of them? Yes. Yes. Um, uh, First of all, I wanted to simply acknowledge to my children and to all children, like I've been going into classrooms and I want to acknowledge, like, if you are afraid, it is okay to feel afraid. And I want you to know that I am working so hard and everyone in your community is working so hard to make a difference and to make changes. There's still time. There's still so much that we can do. And these girls and young women who I interviewed, most of them can't even vote yet, yet they're speaking up. They're talking to their parents. They're talking to their family members. They're making phone calls to their leaders and their communities And we know now, we know the science, we know what causes climate change, and we can build a better world. So I just really tell them, and we do journaling activities to um, really write down all the things that people are doing, all the things that we can do. I really want kids to feel empowered. Mm, Yeah, absolutely. And learning about these girl warriors is certainly a great way to empower kids. I know 
you know, when you when you say to a kid, hey, you can do anything, you know, you 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 can grow up to be anything you want to be. It sounds good. But when you actually see a kid, a person your age or a person that's not too much older than you actually doing something and making a difference, that that really rings true to kids. Yes, yeah. it really does. It really does. And especially when, I mean, the reality is, um, especially as kids are getting older and becoming teenagers and in high school and in college, um, one of the things that, that surprised me while writing Girl Warriors is that um, these young women spoke to me so openly about their anxiety. And there's a word for it. It's eco-anxiety just how much um, they struggle sometimes with, with just even like sleeping because they're so worried and anxious and, and angry. Um, But what's amazing is that they are doing something and they're getting their leaders to do something and they're rising up and they're speaking up. And so they're really channeling their fears to really um, to make changes and they also reminded me as well as how important it is to take care of yourself. So spend time with your friends, go outside, go on walks, be in nature, communicate your feelings to your friends and your family and people you trust. Yeah. I, I think that's that, that advice to get outside, especially getting outside with our kids. I, mm-hmm. You know, you protect what you love. And a great way to start, you know, if, if you you want to get your family involved in protecting the planet, you want to protect the planet with your kids, a great way to start is just to help your kids fall in love with the planet. And what better way to do it than to be out in nature? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And I know, I know, Jed, that, that you have kids as well. And just like that, like mama bear papa bear instinct to like I will do anything to protect you like I love you like that was really what generated for me um writing this book it's just I've got to do something for the future for all kids everywhere um and the the seed for this book was actually a, a feature that I wrote for the Washington Post when um In 2018, I interviewed 14 climate activists, and I quickly realized that it was their parents behind them who were making this work possible. I mean, they couldn't drive yet. Their parents were driving them to the climate strikes, were helping them stay organized, follow up with emails to um, their congressional leaders. And it's really parents who can really get behind their kids to help them and support them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. We had a little um, warrior here when my my son was in kindergarten. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the one of the things that stands out is one of his classmates uh, on on a drive home from school saw uh, that a goose had been hit by a car, mm. and it really upset him. And and there was yeah. uh, this one particular road where there were lots of geese, and he did something about it. He started writing to the mayor. And uh, the, 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 the city came by and they erected a, um, a goose crossing signs, slow down. And uh, I don't think there's been another uh, goose casualty at that yeah. spot since then. Yes. Uh, amazing. And that, that is such a good example to show how speaking up, how you can change things. Um, another thing that, that, the on that note that the, activists pointed out to me is how everything is connected like you said like our system of roads how we build things how everything is connected to something else so it's not just the climate crisis alone but the climate climate crisis is affecting animals all over the world it's affecting like how um people of lower income in their communities and whether um the what the air quality is like if they're living near a coal plant and how just like yeah a simple change like putting up a sign can really help animals yeah. in our community yeah. so let's get to know a couple of these girl warriors why don't we start uh, who was the youngest warrior that you met let's see i believe that was lily who lives in the netherlands she actually started when she was seven years old, um, picking up garbage on the street with her grandpa. And they started just going on walks 
And by the time that Lily was um, 10, 11 years old, she was speaking up all over the world about plastic pollution and what happens when um, we continue to make things out of plastic and how it's affecting the ocean and it's affecting our water. And she has now become such a spokesperson about plastic pollution in the world. So, yeah, she was only seven. Um, let's see. There's um, Haven Coleman, who's in Colorado. And when Haven was just in elementary school and she was in fifth grade, she um, started learning about um, what was happening to animals. One of her favorite animals is the sloth. And she started learning about the climate crisis. And she just got really fired up and asked her mom to start driving her to town hall in Denver so she could strike every Friday and sit on the steps. Well, then Haven ended up um, contacting Greta Thunberg and learning about what she was doing, and Haven co-founded the U.S. Youth Climate Strike and organized thousands of youth all across um, the United States in 2019. So these were kids who were just in elementary school um, who just decided to, to speak up. That's really, it's really incredible when you think about that. I mean, I remember being in fifth grade, and I don't think I was thinking about saving the sloths or, or, or you know, doing, you know, running a strike in, in front of City Hall. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, yeah, I also, I also interviewed um, a young woman named Shreya Ramachandran, and she was, when she was in sixth grade, she's from the same area in California where I live. And she went to India to visit her grandparents and realized like the land was so dry, just like it is in California. And after years of drought, and she saw in India, like people actually struggling to get drinking water. So she came home and um, realized thanks to her grandma that if you use a different kind of soap that doesn't affect the water, you can um, reuse that water, it's called gray water, to like water your plants and um, reuse your water from your laundry and your dishes. So she founded something called the Gray Water Project when she was in middle school. And now she's taught like more than 50,000 people all over the world about gray water. She wrote a curriculum. She just started at Stanford. Now she's a freshman. And it's just been incredible to see how she was only 12 years old um, when she started doing this. And now, like, I'm seeing in California, in my own community, they're starting to, um, with new buildings, to reuse the water. Because this is just clean water that's coming from the mountains, but mm -hmm. we could reuse it, you know, to water our, our gardens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, one of the things that always baffles me and, you know, we're hearing so much about the fires and the drought in California. And at the same time here on the East Coast, where it, it has literally rained almost yeah. every day since the beginning of August here in, in the Boston area. And it's like, why aren't we able to get the water where there's a surplus to mm -hmm. the places where it's needed. I mean, we're able to transport oil and gas from, you know, Canada to Mexico. Why we're, we're not able to get water to where it needs to be? Yeah, it's it's such a good question. I actually just interviewed um, somebody yesterday for my next climate book that I'm working on that's for teen readers. And she works in water management, and she was telling me it's about how we manage water. It's like from the top down. We need to really think the way, rethink the way that we manage our systems. Like it's a systemic problem. We can't keep doing things the way we've been doing. And she was pointing out, you know, we do have enough water, like you said, and we still have the resources right now. So we need to make the changes in how we're, we're managing um, managing them. And I don't, I don't know if you've heard about this in the news, but um, COP26, the 2021 UN United Nations Climate Change Conference is coming up really soon. It starts at the end of October. And this is where all the world leaders will be converging in Glasgow. And they're going to be talking about these issues. How do we manage things from way up 
from starting with the leaders of the, of every country in the world so that we can really start saving water and producing energy in a different way that we're not relying on fossil fuels. So it's really exciting just this week um, and next week, a lot of the climate activists from Girl Warriors are starting to make their way to Europe so that they can be there at um, COP26. And they're really asking, they're saying, please let us have a voice. Um, some of the biggest polluting countries in the world have had the biggest voices and have the seats at the table every single year of this climate change conference. It's time for you to listen to us mm -hmm. this year. Mm -hmm. Do you think a lot of our issues around uh, water and resources and the misuse of, of uh, oil and, and, and whatnot, do you think it might stem from fear? It's like, oh, I, I, I know I, we need to do something better for the world, and I know the people in California need this water, but, man, if we let them have it, then we might not have it, and I... You know, is we? It sounds like we really have to change the way that we're thinking and think less about me and more mm -hmm. about we. Yes, thank you. Yes, so true. It's fear. I think it's it's greed. A lot of it, mm -hmm. like the fossil fuel industry, has made a lot of money. I think like people are really, really afraid. Well, what would happen if I just gave up what I've been doing my whole life, my family's been doing, how would I pivot to make energy in a different way? I mean, it is scary, um, but youth are saying, we, we can retrain people. We will make sure everybody has a job because that's a lot of the fear is like, what would I do if I didn't do this job that I've been doing my whole life? Um, so it's, it's really exciting that in the United States, we have new leaders in, in office and, um, I'm hopeful. <laughs> Getting back to the girl warriors that you, that you interviewed, what was the most uh, surprising warrior or, or what was the, the, the thing that the warrior, this uh, particular war, warrior was doing that was most surprising to you? Um, let's see, I, I had the fortune of being able to interview um, one of the activists named Isha Clark, because Isha is in Oakland, which is just down the road from me. And um, it was in, in, I heard about Isha first by seeing um, a video of Isha online that totally blew me away. So this video went viral. Um, Isha was, um, a teenager and Isha is now at Harvard, Howard University, just started there as a freshman. So Isha was um, in high school and interning for a group called Youth Versus Apocalypse in the Bay Area. And another group of activists said, hey, do you want to come? We're going to California Senator Dianne Feinstein's office. We're going to deliver a letter to Feinstein and ask Feinstein to please vote yes on the Green New Deal, which is a proposal that um, for leaders to tackle climate change in the United States. Well, Isha went with this group of kids and showed up at the office and they were all really surprised because Feinstein came down the stairs to talk to them. Well, Isha approached Feinstein very politely and said, it's so nice to meet you. I really want to talk to you about how the U.S. might be able to produce energy in a different way without emitting fossil fuels. And Feinstein got so angry and so defensive, and Feinstein said, I've been doing this work for 30 years. You can't come in here and tell me what to do. You can't tell me that it has to be my way or the highway. I'm not going to talk to you. Isha just listened. Isha was so, so calm, and Isha said, I hear what you're saying, um, and I am listening to you. I understand what your job is. I'm asking you to please also listen to us. And it was incredible. Isha was like not intimidated, calmly spoke. This this video went viral because it just showed how Isha spoke in such a clear, calm, brave way um, to this leader who's been in office for decades. Mm -hmm. And um, it really made quite a, a splash on social media because so many people were taken by um, by Isha. Yeah, what a great role model for what a great role model for Senator Feinstein. <laughs> <laughs>
I'm, I'm, I'm really surprised to, to, to hear that um, a politician would, would react that way, especially in public with cameras. Um, I know. Boy. <laughs> you know, I... You know, we always talk about, you know, the conversations that families can have as they're reading books together. And we encourage families to continue to read with their kids mm-hmm. long after they're able to read together. Because, you know, your third grader may, girl worries might not be something your third graders will be able to read on their own right away. But they can certainly read it with you. And if you're taking turns reading reading Girl Warriors and finding out about these incredible young women who are making a difference and inspiring and, and, you know, just turning to your daughter at one point and saying, you could do this too. Yeah. What an empowering experience that could be. It really is. Yeah. My youngest is in fourth grade and it's been really sweet. She's been asking me to read Girl Warriors with her at night um, she has made some grammatical corrections, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they're true. I told her she should have edited the manuscript, <laughs> but um, it's amazing because she, before COVID hit, um, she went to so many climate strikes with me, so she recognizes some of the young women in the book. Oh, I remember Sarah Goody. I remember, and then she's seen me have, because I wrote the book during the pandemic, mm-hmm. So she um, would walk in like sometimes while I was interviewing because I was homeschooling her at the same time. So she'd say, oh, I know Daphne in New York City. And um, yeah, it's so great because she's seen what um, these young women are doing. Does your daughter have a favorite warrior? Yes, I would say that Daphne Frias is probably her favorite because Daphne, I've chatted with Daphne so many times and I've ended up interviewing um, Daphne for so many stories after I wrote Girl Wire. So Daphne is in New York City and is an incredible um, Latinx climate activist. Um, Her family's from the Dominican Republic. Daphne was also born with cerebral palsy and gets everywhere in a wheelchair. Daphne's headed right now to COP26 in Glasgow. And um, Daphne has become such a leader in her community in West Harlem. She actually ran for office in her community. She just won her second term. She runs an office of all women who are just making sure that people in her community get basic resources like food. And Daphne is in medical school to become a medical doctor um, because Daphne has pointed out to me that public health health is completely connected to the climate crisis. It is affecting um, people's health. And so she is just a powerhouse and incredible. Yeah, it sounds like it. Uh, In a minute, I'm going to ask you for, you know, you mentioned a couple of things, but, uh, you know, I'm I'm going to ask you if there's an activity that you could suggest families to do together after experiencing Girl Warriors. But before I I ask you that, Mm -hmm. you did you write about Girl Warriors because you wanted to highlight the girls that are doing this? Or is it just that there are more girls doing this kind of work? Both. My, my whole intention for writing this book was to promote and to try and show people, to provide a platform for these girls and young women who are speaking out. So I'm like, if there's any way that I can provide a platform and help um, amplify their voices, I want to do that. At the same time, while I was um, writing the book, I quickly realized every time I turned around, there's a different climate strike. I realized that it was girls and young women are leading these strikes, and very often girls and young women of color. And so it's incredible. If you look all around the world, girls and young women really are at the forefront of, of leading. They are incredibly organized. I'm blown away. Um, I get asked a lot, like, well, how did you even find them? Well, for social media, they're mostly on, on Instagram and Twitter. And they led me to each other. Like, every time I interviewed another activist, she would say, you should speak to my friend. They really opened their doors. They introduced me to their moms, their dads. 
their um their siblings and they yeah they made it so easy <laughs> that's awesome that's awesome now is there something uh, about girls i mean are guys just too busy with sports and <laughs> video games or you know what what do you think it is i think yeah, that, that's a good question. I mean, I will point out that quite a few of the activists I interviewed are also non-binary. They use the pronoun they, are um, queer as well. And so um, I'd say in my experience, and this is where it really resonated with me as growing up as a girl, I was a super sensitive, very anxious kid. Mm. Um, and so very, very sensitive. You know, I think a lot of like girls and young women like, are really deep feeling and can articulate their feelings. Also, their organizational skills blew me away. So just seeing like they organize their calendars in such an incredible way, like one phone call after another. I mean, some of them stayed up way too late in order to have like jump onto Slack or Zoom to have conference calls with people um, across the world, but they were incredibly organized and it's so like, I would set up a time and text them. Okay. So yeah, tomorrow, two o'clock, they're there Mm -hmm. right there. I mean, most, so many adults who I deal with are not that organized. (laughs) Yeah. So getting back, is there an activity that you can suggest families, um, after they listen to this or after they finish reading girl warriors or even better yet, I think, Sounds like Girl Warriors would be that perfect book to read about one warrior every night. Yes. And just ex- yeah, spread out yeah. the experience. Um, yeah. But is there an activity that you can suggest families can get involved in that can really kind of inspire their kids to do more work? Well, Jed, you and I were chatting before um, before we jumped on just simply about getting out into nature. Mm-hmm. That would be first just I really do believe – if you experience what it's like to be outside, you care. You care about the trees in your neighborhood. You see the animals. You see the birds. And so simply having that experience of being outside, going on walks, going on bike rides in your neighborhood, I think once you start seeing, um, feeling nature, then you just care about it. So that for me, I'm like, get outside with your kids, get outside into nature. And then you have, you just feel like you most likely want to protect, (laughs) you know, your, your gardens, your parks. Um, And that's another thing, like I started during the pandemic, like gardening with my kids. My older daughter just like is incredible. She's grown so many plants. She's taught me so much. Um, And Yeah, if you have a way to, like, garden, find a community garden, um, one of the journaling activities I have done is just simply to also just acknowledge that it's okay if you're afraid. So I've told, you know, I've journaled with with, uh, second, third, and fourth graders to simply do a simple activity, like write down what you are afraid of, write down the words, and then from there, let's write down what we can do. Um, in the world Um, because it's okay to feel afraid but then we can do things we can talk to our parents we can Mm -hmm. tell them you know how we're feeling and can we work together and do this yeah and and i would suggest any parent who's listening out there no matter where you land on this on this debate because i know there are a lot of there's a lot of controversy listen to your kids Mm -hmm. listen to them don't don't uh, you know don't do it what Senator Feinstein did and act like you have all the information and all the answers, sit down and acknowledge that your kid has concerns, respect that and work together. Yes. Yeah. Sarah, Rachel, excuse Rachel, tell everybody please where they can find out more about you and where they can find out more about girl warriors. Yeah. So I'm, I'm all over social media. So if you just look for Rachel, Sarah, you'll find me on Twitter and you'll find me on Instagram, and that's the best place to connect me with me. Um, I also, my website is my name, rachelsarah.com, and I love, love communicating with parents and young people. So send me a message. 
We've had a really inspiring time speaking to the author of Girl Warriors, Rachel Sarah. Hey, Rachel, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you so much, Chad. Thanks for having me. Please be sure to join us for the next episode of the Reading with Three Kids podcast. Our guest will be Jamie Brooke. She'll be celebrating Wilbert the Wombat Social Distances. Hey, I want to thank the folks who made today's show so wonderful. Of course, I want to start by thanking our guest, Rachel Sarah. Please be sure to check out Girl Warriors. Find out about those 25 young activists that are helping us save the world. Also want to thank my team, Alejandra Dari, Fatima Khan, Rory Grady, Michael Murphy. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all the support she gives me. Most of all, we all want to thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And as always, thank you so very much for taking the time to make the world a better place by reading with your kids and protecting the planet with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast.